The eastern cottontails have a white star in their forehead, sometimes, usually. Sometimes it's one or two hairs, and sometimes it's not even there. Uh, the New England cottontail usually have a black spot in the middle of their forehead, but then if you rough the fur on an eastern cottontail, it looks like a black spot. So, and there are a few other morphometric features, but it's not very conclusive. So, folks in my lab actually came up with a barcode, just like you'd see at the grocery store. It's a DNA barcode, and we can get tissue from an animal, actually just from the fecal material of the animal, extract the DNA from that, and tell what species it is. Around that time in the early to mid 1900s is that there was the introduction of the eastern cottontail. And that's the more common rabbit that everyone will see in their backyard. It's in my backyard. They're on campus. They're pretty much everywhere. One of the, the causes for the decline of the New England cottontail could be the eastern cottontail. And as we understand it, hundreds of thousands of eastern cottontails were imported into New England from as far away as Texas and, and uh, West Virginia. We've, we're actually finding DNA, DNA in our lab from eastern cottontails from mountaintops in Texas. It's really quite amazing. It was nearly 200,000 of these rabbits that were brought in from different parts of the West. And one of the things is that there's multiple subspecies of the eastern cottontail. So there's really um, a mixture of rabbits, eastern cottontails from all over the country that we find here in New England now. And in, in DNA terms, we found over a hundred haplotypes for eastern cottontail and that's just the DNA sequence you know different DNA sequences and New England cottontail we've only found 15 haplotypes. You know when we do a field investigation for example we're looking for a forest understory that has a significant amount of vegetation right. so things like uh, greenbrier, bullbrier, blackberry, raspberry, you know, when we see something like that in the forest, then we're probably going to do some manipulation of the tree layer, the tree canopy, to daylight that. You've got to get that energy from the sun down to the forest floor where the rabbits can harvest it. If it's all captured by the canopy of the tree, they're not going to be able to harvest that energy. So it's almost like we're talking about two sweet spots. One is what you just said right. about the forest canopy and getting sufficient sunlight, right. but maybe not too much, too much. Right. because that's going to change temperature and moisture conditions and Absolutely. may also leave them more vulnerable to predation. We had coyote come right through here. Yes. Like half an hour before the rabbit, <clears throat> or half an hour right. after the rabbit, right. and uh, <clears throat> they survived. Right. They survived. And I could see a coyote having a tough Hard time, time getting through some yeah. of this stuff. Very difficult to be fast enough with the evasive maneuvers right. of a rabbit. That's right. So I think that's really yeah. helping them in this environment here. Yeah. But still we're losing some. Yeah. The ones that we've recovered have been in open areas like this. Like, if it is killed, do they take it to an open area, feed on it, and then the radio or gets left get there? Hit. Hard to say. Yeah. You know, we've started to discuss how we need this, this young, regenerating forest yeah. uh, for the cottontails and other species. One way in which I try to, you know, sort of pull people in and, and make them see that things are, we're thinking about these things differently than we did, say, 30 or 40 years ago, when the emphasis was on mature forest. And of course, we're not saying that we don't value mature forest, it's simply that we have a lot of it now. Right, too much of it. Too point. much of it compared to the as you said, 3%, only 3% that's in young forest in New England. So, you know, sometimes landowners will react, especially if they, if they see one of the cuts. It can look, you know, visually, you know, sort of very destructive and, and you know, people can be shocked by it. And, you know, what I like to say is if you think about, um, you know, Google Maps, and you're zoomed in to a 20-acre area that's been cut over, it might seem like a, you know, a disaster. But if you zoom out, you realize it's, it's really just a disturbance in the landscape. Within a large landscape, right? You have to consider the context, don't you? Exactly right, yeah. Consider that larger context, that it's, it's really not um, an enormous clear cut. It's really a disturbance which will regenerate 
and provide a now somewhat unique habitat for the rabbit and for these other species. Some people have asked me why in the world are we trying to preserve this rabbit? There is uh, an old saying, I think maybe Aldo Leopold said this. You know, he was the first wildlife biologist and uh, you know, he said that the first intelligent rule of tinkering is to keep all the parts. You know, if you're working on your grandfather's pocket watch and you tear it apart, you're tinkering with it, the first thing you want to do is keep all the parts. And these various species, New England cottontail being one of them, is one of those parts.